Welcome to the show. I'm Ryan McNeese. I'm here with my co-host, Eric Wolfram. Also our two guests today, Garrett and Martin. Thank you both for being here. Two interns uh, in the legal industry. We're here in downtown Spokane talking about uh, what it means to be in law school and what it means to be an intern and the backstories of both these individuals. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So tell us a, a little bit about uh, what brought you to law school in the first place and, and where you came from geographically. Martin, why don't you start us out? Geographically, um, so I'm originally from Armenia. I uh, was raised there, born and raised in Armenia. I came here when I was eight years old um, and then came to Los Angeles and you know pursued education and decided I wanted to go to law school. <laughs> what was the what was the reasoning for Los Angeles for your family? I think well as Armenians we knew that there were a population of Armenians in Los Angeles and California specifically so that's all we knew and hmm. we decided to go we had some friends but not relatives in um, Los Angeles or Glendale which is part of Los Angeles and um, you know we we immigrated there we, we got an apartment and some of my classmates in middle school were also Armenian, so they kind of helped me learn the language, adapt. So it was really interesting and challenging for me, but you know, yeah, I think I'm at a nice place in my life now and I'm enjoying it. It's wonderful. What is the impetus for uh, you coming from LA choosing Gonzaga Law School? You're both second year law students just starting out the, the school year. Uh, what was the, the reason for choosing Gonzaga Law? Well, I applied to some schools in Los Angeles and California, but Gonzaga actually offered me a generous scholarship. I came visited uh, Spokane and Gonzaga, and I just loved Spokane. I thought just for my studies, I thought it was so somewhere I could, you know, focus on my studies and not be distracted by my friends or going out too much. So I thought, uh, you know, making this decision to come to Spokane to Gonzaga was financially feasible and I think for my academics it was the right move. Good overall environment. Yep. Uh, Garrett, for you, uh, you grew up in Washington State. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm from Cop, Washington on the west side, just south of Seattle. Uh, went to Washington State University, go Cougs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did ROTC there, spent some time in the Air Force, and now coming back, so it's Come to Gonzaga for was just kind of like another step of coming home for me, which right. was great because I love the Pacific Northwest. You know, like born and raised here, um, I love the mountains, love to be outside. And well, in terms of coming home, you, as you mentioned, you were in the Air Force, so you yeah. bounced around a bit in terms of several yep. locales. Yep. So I was stationed at F.E. Warren Air Force Base uh, in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I uh, lived in Colorado because the border, the border is really close there. Um, I was I was a uh, 21 Mike, which is ammunition's a maintenance officer for the ICBMs uh, mm. down there in Wyoming. So you took care of our missiles. That's the long and short of it. Thank yeah. you. There we go. Thank yeah. you. So yeah, so did that. Um, didn't love it. That's why I decided to you know get out and pursue my legal career. Um, I studied political science pre-law at Wazoo, so that was kind of some some background there. And then so coming to Gonzaga, um, just a great area i'm used to the eastern side of the state um, a lot less traffic which is mm -hmm. great um and so i just to me it was just kind of a very natural fit um, i never anticipated going to gonzaga and then um, when i was accepted it just it just was so easy and so natural coming back that just kind of well, um, both garrett and martin a piece of this conversation eric uh, generally is doing a, a talk show on a, on a weekly basis uh, Schoolhouse 180 with right. and, and Eric's background in the education world, uh, both as a teacher himself and now at ESD 101, essentially teaching teachers and focusing on education programs. Uh, what is it that you guys are seeing uh, at the law school that seems to resonate with, uh, and we'll talk about here in a bit, you're doing internships here in Spokane as well. Uh, how are you seeing that correlation between the, the education you feel like you're getting here now in your second year of law school and what you're also seeing uh, in the day-to-day -day practice of law? Go ahead, Garrett. <laughs> uh, I would say like this, the second year, um, the professors kind of expect a lot more of you now. You know, they don't, they don't kind of ease into things. Um, I've noticed the pace is a lot quicker. They kind of jump in and they just expect you to kind of keep up. Uh, the things that I've seen that have been successful for a lot of the professors is just kind of like that, that really 
back and forth dialogue in the classroom. So, you know, here's here's what we're talking about. Here's a hypothetical on how we apply it. And then class discussion on how do I see it? How do I see it? You know, different policies behind our reasoning and then kind of rational way through it. Are you starting to feel like, uh, maybe you saw this in your first year too, but now it sounds like you're describing that correlation in your second year, that there is a tangible, what you're seeing uh, in a law firm type experience uh, that that what is being taught is is correlating. That I, there's a nexus there. There are some things that I've learned in, in my first year of law school that I've actually used in the workplace, yes, but I actually firmly believe that having hands-on experience at a law firm, it it might be a little bit more valuable because you know you're dealing with clients, you're dealing with your uh, attorneys are like mentoring you and it's just it's more real life you know than just reading cases that you know are from like the 1980s or right. 70s which which I'd argue mm -hmm. you know and this this is a, a concept that Eric and I talk about at the junior high and high school mm -hmm. level uh, about the practicality of right. education more that idea of that project based mm -hmm. <clears throat> from an education point of view that project based learning but it's relevant mm -hmm. you know are you actually going through and utilizing the things that you're learning at that time. And it makes a huge difference, obviously, which is a piece that you guys are talking about right now, of being able to have the hands-on, working with clients, not just doing the book study type yeah. things. But I think what, what I see in, in the programs that Eric takes part in, in the middle school and high school area is, again, that relevance factor of not just doing geometry for geometry's sake or, or right. what have you, or using the Oculus, VR, but is it, is is attaching that as you said Blended to a, a project yeah. that then you realize why this geometry or why Do geometry and build dog houses right you know, something you know yeah. to where you're actually utilizing that skill that you're learning well and I've I've enjoyed uh, in depth conversations with Eric about that because I think at any level of education whether it is the elementary school right uh, middle school high school undergraduate law school etc. I don't think it changes in the in the fact that you need that correlation or it doesn't resonate. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I, I don't know if this is a second year class, but uh, uh, litigation uh, uh, clinic, if you will, in terms yeah. of, is that offered second or third year? That's actually first year litigation okay. skills. That's a course we, we take and it kind of um, goes over you know, basic basic procedural like how how to file a complaint, how to how to communicate with clients, something like that. I think it you know a, a word that's thrown around probably too much, but is that holistic, mm -hmm. or looking at the the whole practical piece of the student and the education. But uh, for me, in the practice of law, I I think that is something that. Uh, on a daily basis resonates because it kind of takes all the pieces you mm -hmm. you you are and it, you can read the book and you can assimilate the cases but then you're in front of clients on a daily basis yeah. or on the phone and interacting right. i think it does take a lot of the uh, multiple factors yeah there's so many complexities to really any profession mm -hmm. that it's such a big piece to think that holistic you know whether it's right. being in the classroom you know student teaching Yep. is a huge piece and uh, it's a it's a must you know just having that real world experience versus a theory that's a good point you could have your master's in education but then step into the classroom can you engage that's with right. the students absolutely and and i would imagine there's a question for you have you felt like at gonzaga law uh that the individuals the professors that i've had many interactions with that are off the charts intellectuals have you felt like they've been to parlay that into practical skills as well i would say from the experience that i've had i think that the professors do as, as well as a job as they can right because i think and at least for someone like me i learn by doing 99 percent by doing um so there's theory and then there's everything right. else right and so for me it's like right i can i can write this down and i can analyze it and i can understand it i can regurgitate it but then to step into an office and have someone assign something to you and then say, I need this done, mm -hmm. is an entirely different concept. And the first time I actually did it was, uh, it'll, it was a little terrifying because you you know you don't know what you don't know. And right, right. now, the level, things I don't know are much greater than the things I do know. Right. And so that was extraordinarily helpful. And then as you kind of go through that process, which I think is where all your, your money is at, and 
you know, having conversations with attorneys, you realize that the attorneys themselves don't memorize the law. It's it's their brain and how they work through problems that is where is where their legal profession actually comes in handy and how they deal with problems and how they parse them out and break them down in, in the smaller pieces and actually get to a conclusion. It's kind of like doing long division. The critical know? thing. Yeah, you know, the, the teacher always showed me in on third grade, like, you need to show your work. I was like, but I know the answer. Well, the answer is not the important part. It's how you That's got right. there. You I, I want to maybe even circle back a little bit at many of the different shows and interviews that Eric and I have had the opportunity to do over the last several years. Uh, I'm always interested in why somebody is doing what they do because everybody has a different focus and reason for the decisions they make. Uh, many people that you're sitting alongside in law school or go over on main campus, somebody that's getting a PhD in history or education or what have you, they're doing it for a different reason. For both of you, uh, what do you think really drove you to want to study law, potentially practice law? And and from my point of view on that education mm -hmm. side of that, because I'm with you, I enjoy that too. We talk about pathways. Yeah. In other words, you came at eight, you know, you're in Penal Allop and then, uh, you know, what led you to that piece? How'd you go from this step to this step to this step? Right. I've got a 15 year old at home. He's starting to make some of those decisions and what, what got you? you down yeah, that what path? leads you down that path? <laughs> it's interesting. So, <clears throat> For me, um, if when we compare like the legal system in, in the United States and, and the legal system elsewhere, mm -hmm. for instance, Armenia, where I'm from, the system in, in Armenia is completely corrupt. So it's very difficult for um, citizens to use the legal system for their advantage mm -hmm. because of the corruptions. When, when we immigrated here, we see that, you know, knowing the law is actually advantageous and you could use it to your advantage and and succeed and um, being armed with that knowledge e exactly mm -hmm. and and that was like an awakening for me you know and I, I noticed that people who understand the law and that are legal legal I guess law-abiding citizens right. actually do well in life and that's what persuade and I don't have any um, relatives or family members in in the legal field my you know not a lot of us are very knowledgeable in, in, in the legal field. So I decided to take it on and, and help my community, help, help my family to understand that, you know, if you follow the law in this country, then you could do well for yourself. You can make good money, take care of your ch children and family. What I like about or find fascinating about that answer is I would imagine politically, psychologically or otherwise, some of the individuals that you're sitting next to in the amphitheater in particular class, you're being glass half full about your optimism of why mm -hmm. I'm here and, and the change I can hopefully lead uh, along that path, right. right? But I'd imagine a decent percentage of individuals are a little glass half empty as to our system. And I think as you're describing, it might not be perfect, but it isn't bad. Yeah, it's, it's not a, bad. It's a great system. It, it's not. It's not bad at all. And I've noticed, you know, learning the law, being a, a, a good citizen, and, and trying to do well for yourself and help other people, you know, that's gonna work well for you. And it's you're. I think you're gonna be prosperous by doing that. Mm -hmm. That's so. a good point, Martin. Garrett, what do you think? So when I when I originally was in college and I joined ROTC, mm -hmm. um, I didn't really have a whole lot of direction. I, I knew I kind of wanted to study law, but I didn't really know when. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what I was. Was ROTC to do. early in college, like uh, sophomore year? Okay, yeah. Okay. So, uh, kind of went through that, and then I was. I guess when I graduated, I didn't really have a plan. Um, I was kind of hoping just the military would give me one, um, and you know, it didn't work out in the way that I had wanted to. But the military was a phenomenal experience for me. Um, had I known what I know, you know, now the military then, I would have still done it the same way. Um, the experiences that I had and. You know, I was in charge of, you know, 40 to 60 right. people as a 24 year old, 22 year old yeah. with a graduate, you know, and they're looking to me to tell them what to do. Yeah. And, and a leader to very, yeah, the age. secret is I had no clue what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found myself doing. Probably not true though. <laughs> yeah. no, no, truly though, for what you had been taught and right. trained to do, you did know what you were doing. Yeah, it just, it feels internally, you know, yeah. it feels like you don't have the answers. Um, 
But what I found myself doing for these people every single day was, you know, working through their problems, whether it was, you know, getting them the right tools so that they could work on the system properly or, you know, setting the programs up that they need to make to make them successful or personal problems, mm -hmm. problems with kids, uh, wives, uh, drinking problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find myself as an advocate for them because at the end of the day, the enlisted personnel are the ones who get the job done for us and, you know, allow us to do this kind of stuff every single day. But once again, the practicality of what you're describing, uh, you dealing with those particular issues of enlisted individuals, uh, family issues, uh, substance abuse issues, interactions amongst different groups, that is in fact obviously what the practice of law Absolutely. is. Uh, so yeah. it's pretty darn practical. Yeah, and so it's, it's extraordinarily um, useful perspective. And so, you know, coming back and now working with clients and, you know, getting to experience and it's the same process it's now it's just more formalized right, and there's right. an actual system in place for me to do that and the military angle for me I enjoyed advocating for my the people who work for me um, more so than the actual military itself and so it's like I can do this I can do what I'm doing now I can just do it in a different way what do you think about the hierarchies of your military experience and the the leadership hierarchies and the structure of the management system versus either what you see in a legal education system or what you've seen uh, currently with your experience in the legal industry? I would say that the military does a lot of things extraordinarily well and one of them is, is planning, um, another is executing. Um, sometimes, however, and oftentimes, and this has been in the news recently, is we forget about the people and the people that wear the uniform. Um, and that's why suicide rates are up. Um, we've lost more vets and, and soldiers to suicides than, you know, in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and so, to me, that human element sometimes gets lost. And I think that's an extraordinarily important to remember that. And so I think taking that into law school, you kind of remember that the clients, and they have these problems and they might be demanding, they still have that human element to them as well. Right. Absolutely. And I think that it's important to remember that and to have that perspective. And I think that's an, that's an interesting piece too, when you start to talk about the people and remembering the people. And, you know, I think one of the questions that I have, again, from that education side is, were there people along the way, and I'm gonna come back to that pathway, right? Were there people along the way that influenced you to take this route into, um, into, into the law? Well, and just to so. piggyback on that, as Martin said, you didn't necessarily have family right. in and of itself, and, and nor did I. I had, yeah, I had other that's... friends and parents, but rather somebody yeah. along that pathway had to have some type of motivating factor. Right. I would, I would say my, my father, I mean, he was a police officer. He was uh, worked in Renton for 32 years. So I, I kind of grew up in a pseudo military household. Yeah. You know, things were very regimented. Um, and I think that did turn me into kind of the person I am today. And so it made the military more of a natural fit. Right. Um, and it kind of led me in that path and that kind of structure. Uh, and so what I, what I was more fascinated in the, you know, the theory and, and the actual working after, you know, what the police officers would do as opposed to necessarily, you know, the action out on the street and whatnot. And so that, that to Law me- Law and order. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and just kind of being that advocate and, you know, kind of standing up and saying, hey, this isn't right, or this, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing it like this, or, you know, this person has obviously been harmed and we need to fix wrong. it. I, I, to that, I've always said, I, I think one impetus for the practice of law or the legal industry is understanding how it worked. And I think, yeah. uh, Martin, you touched on this too from Armenia and your experience there where maybe a little more corruption. Uh, uh, I've had opportunities early in my career in the finance business, et cetera, where uh, understanding how all of these pieces go together and work and how the law can piggyback with business uh, uh, to make it function, as you said, law and order, make all the pieces come together to efficiently, uh, to have the legal system work efficiently. Uh, would have to bring this up. Uh, I know one uh, job in your history it, that I think it really interests me because it shows your willingness, uh, whether you're dressed up in your suit and tie and you're walking into law school or into a law firm and here in downtown Spokane, uh, you had a job in the summer of cleaning honey buckets. Yeah, or porta potties. Porta potties. For everyone who doesn't know what those are. <laughs> okay, porta potties. Uh, to me, hearing that story is awfully impressive because someone that is willing to clean upwards of 
thousands, thousands of <laughs> porta potties. Uh, in all seriousness, I got to give you credit though, because that means you're willing to do what it takes. Yeah. It was, How do you think that shapes you? It was one of those things where my, my parents challenged me. They basically told me that uh, I wasn't going to go to a four university um, out, out the gate. Um, it wasn't financially in the plan for them. And so they, I was going to go to Pierce College and I was going to do that whole thing. Um, and to me, I've always been kind of a person who, who finds the grain and then finds an avenue to kind of go against it. Not necessarily to cause conflict, um, but just to kind of question Bit why. Bit of a contrarian, if you yeah. Right now. And so to me, um, Honey Bucket was just a means to an end. Um, it was, you know, it was 10 bucks an hour um, and then, you know, guaranteed 80 hours a week. And so we worked the entire summer, you know, but it paid for college, you know, and I was able to graduate with no debt. And so that, that was, you know, a tremendous experience um, for me. And so I, I, I think that that perspective to not only to be challenged and then to prove someone wrong mm -hmm. um, in a good way, right. um, but then also to kind of have that, you know, like, oh, I can, if I set my mind to this, I can, I can easily do it. You know, it's just, I think that's, that's the number one thing is people are always in, giving challenges, especially in law school, it's just, just challenge after challenge. You just have to find your own path and everyone's is gonna be a little bit different. But you do have to be willing to do it. Right. And yes, those challenges are presented, uh, presented and there's, you know, in anybody's life or right. pathway theme that we've been discussing, there's there's roadblocks in there that there's a certain amount of uh, talent, there's a certain amount of grit, perseverance. I'd always throw in, there's a certain amount of luck too, in terms of things going your way. Uh, and so it takes all of that. And I think, as you said, you are willing to do the job that we're, we're making light of in terms of cleaning porta potties. But even if that opportunity was granted to somebody because this is going to get them into a two year school, four year school, et cetera, there's plenty of people <clears throat> stereotypically that say, I'm not willing to do that. Yeah. But you pulled the trigger, and I think yeah. that's uh, commendable. And, and we didn't get a chance to have you answer in terms of uh, Martin if there was somebody out there even though your family yeah wasn't necessarily in the legal industry but was there so my family my parents strongly advised me to go to school mm -hmm. okay just you know go get your education but they didn't necessarily guide me where or ask me what I wanted to do they just said go to school that's very important mm -hmm. um, the idea is I, I just tried to associate myself with successful students at school in school so for instance, when I went to community college first, you know, I was involved in um, athletics. I played water polo and I so associated myself with um, teammates and students who, who wanted to thrive and who wanted to succeed. So got into the honors program, was able to transfer to UCLA and then started associating myself with friends mm -hmm. and, and classmates at UCLA that wanted to do law, wanted to go to law school, yeah, wanted to take the LSAT. And I'm like, what is the LSAT? I don't know what that yeah. is, you know? Oh, this is what it is. Oh, you have to study for it. You have to take these classes or you need to get these letters of recommendations. Oh, that's interesting. I really like law. And one step once, the and side. these are all coming from the students and, and peers that I've associated myself through, through my academic career and not necessarily for my professors, not necessarily for right. my counselors, you know, it's all like who you surround yourself with. And that's something like I, I like doing throughout my life is just associating myself with successful and happy people and trying to gain as much and to also provide and provide my skill set and help them achieve success as well. I think that's right on the point though with Eric's question about mm -hmm. those pathways <clears throat> that that you are going, you're a perfect example of you're going down a respective path, didn't necessarily mean that you're gonna end up yeah. at B, so to speak. But along the way. You met these yeah. folks that then you diverted left or right. Yeah. Uh, well, for instance, tell us a little bit about in your background, uniquely, uh, not only were you doing water polo, uh, but also as a lifeguard. Yeah, so in, I, in I have an extensive um, aquatics <laughs> history. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, my my father was an athlete. He, he he was in wrestling and soccer. So I first got into soccer, played for 10, 10 years, and during while playing soccer, I also got introduced to water polo. And I love water polo, the physicality in the water. You know, super tough, treading in the water for hours, and people 
pulling you down and it, it, it's just it's awesome i love the physicality and the challenge that it presents mm. and with those skills i was uh you know i again through through my um teammates i was introduced to the la county um lifeguarding division and and, and i i applied for it i went through the academy which was rigorous really challenging and now um, I'm a LA County lifeguard. I lifeguard the Los Angeles beaches during the summers. Huh. And you and recently just went I back recently down went to certify back again. And I worked there for two weeks, recertified and got my skills recertified. And I'd like to continue doing that throughout my life, just going back to LA and lifeguarding. Mm -hmm. it's, it just feels amazing walking down the beach, open up your tower, mm. you know, watching the sun out, people yeah. coming into the beach and mm -hmm. rescue some lives yeah. here and there. <laughs> that, that's interesting. I, I do want to, I want to throw it back to, uh, from an education standpoint, mm -hmm. when you're out in the respective districts through EST yeah. 101 and you're teaching teachers, meeting with superintendents, meeting with principals, etc. from what you're hearing, these gentlemen talking about in terms of the correlation between their backgrounds, what was the impetus for them going to law school or graduate school, How does what does that make you think in terms of boots on the ground, teachers in the classroom, mm -hmm. to promote these varying degrees of, of interest? You know, we've talked about the oh, trades, yeah. we've talked yeah. about uh, different professions. What, mm -hmm. what does that make you think in terms of how you how you gear what you're having teachers teach. That's right. To motivate, if you will. I think that's the piece. You know, you've got content and then you've got that motivation piece or just kind of the grit. You talked about yeah. grit, perseverance, and those kinds of things. And obviously, you guys, you guys have that, you know, and that vision of where do you want to go. And I think mm -hmm. that's that biggest piece that we need to make sure from an education point of view that we're really focusing on is how do you build relationships? Because that's, to me, that's that piece that really drives that dream forward you know talk about friends associating yourself yeah. with friends and with people that that led are to the idea in the first are, place it yeah, sounds like yeah exactly you know your dad talked about here's you know some of those things that you need to be thinking about that wasn't just content that was building relationships and people that you trust people that you look up to um and i think that's one of those areas that we go with you know Content's the content, whether it's geometry, can you build a doghouse or not? Right. You know, coming back to that idea. But how do you build relationships and how do you encourage interests and how do you... Um, An environment yeah. for inspiration, whatever that actual whatever inspiration. Whatever it is. Because there's yeah. such a divergence. You two coming to law school yeah. or myself didn't come from the same yeah. place, but you got to the same place, yeah, which is that's right. Imagine living in Spokane. Yeah. I yeah, didn't even 12, know right. what, where Spokane was. And you know, it's just crazy to see myself here and, and I'm happy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this. Yeah. What, what would you say, again, going into the, this is actually the first week, second year, 2L if you will, at Gonzaga Law School, from your experience thus far, uh, uh, the law school has you do externship programs at respective law firms to see, as we discussed earlier, the classroom studies, if you will, law practice, try to combine the two. From what you've seen so far, tough question, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Hmm. Is, it, is it law related? Is it the law that pathway jumped you off to something in business or social services? Yeah, I'm throwing you a zinger. That's right. Should I say five years? <laughs> I think the answer might still be the same. Um, to, for, for me personally, um, there is a chance that I might end up back in the military. I, mm, I did enjoy. I did enjoy that part. Um, I enjoy the structure. Mm. Um, coming, you know, to a civilian world, as it were, is a. Uh, it's very different, um, especially for me. You know, I was talking to my wife about, well, who's in your chain of command? Who's your boss's boss? And she's like, it doesn't. It's not always how it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a path for me, being in in-house counsel, or you know, maybe even being a prosecutor working in the attorney's office. Um, so to me, it's like I don't. It's it's, hard, it's an almost impossible question because it just I don't know 
what my life is going to be on the spot. in two years. Um, and the military does a great job of that. They always kind of keep you on your toes. You never know what's going to happen next. And so I think I've just kind of accepted the fact that I'm not in really control on what happens in the next two years, but I'm just going to do my best where I am and grow where I'm planted see and then the stimulus see what comes in and then right. just take the next step. Interestingly, from what you've commented on though, whether you, do you actually re-enlist per se if you go JAG or are you, officers are a little bit different. So when I first signed up, you do sign up and sign a contract. But after your initial contract, the military um, is, is aware of that. And so they move you every two years, two or three years, depending on your assignment. And every single time the Air Force moves you from one location to another, that incurs a two year commitment. Because it does seem um, like you could be in right. private practice and still right. serve, whether it be Fairchild here locally or right. otherwise, and yeah. you could still serve those particular individuals. Absolutely or go jag, but options. Yeah, yeah. so great. options. Tons what, of options. What do you think, Martin? So five or 10, we gave you the option. Uh, I would, as soon as possible, I would like to kind of intertwine my hobbies and, and my legal c career together and, and work and also enjoy my work and enjoy my other hobbies as well. For instance, I, I love film, I love production. I love real estate, I love property. If I could, you know, kind of combine all of that together in the legal field, help people and also enjoy my hobbies, I, I, I would be fine and l would love my life if well, that worked you know, out. We, yeah. we actually chat about that quite a bit. You know, that good old cliche, life's too short to do something you don't like doing because yeah. you do a lot of it, whatever your profession happens to be. I personally, and I think Eric would be too, uh, an advocate for trying to do just that is is com I think the opportunities are there this day and age to enjoy multiple paths if if, if you right. work at doing it and making it happen exactly and I'm, I'm a firm believer believer of um, being able to balance those things balance your family balance your hobbies balance mm -hmm. your work you know that's I think where happiness arises if you're just doing one thing all your life mm -hmm. I don't know right. like is that Balance Maybe. it out. Balance exactly. is a good word. Yeah. You know, it's kind of that old adage, if you're doing what you love, you're not working a day in your life. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so coming through the hobbies and adding the hobbies in there too is a great idea. And I'd imagine uh, a big core theme of curriculum at all levels that EST 101 deals with is, in essence, call it whatever you want, but that balance of this. exposing students uh, two multiple pathways you know to see what is going to be a fit well, and it's that and expose content to right. the interests of the students as well and how do you start to blend that because that's exactly what you're talking about is that idea of what do you like to do you know what makes you comfortable but then how do you bring the content of law into that mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden it's that blend of those pieces right. and that's a piece that we talk about in the k-12 world often um, we don't always do a great job of it. We're doing much better, but I think it's a piece a that it's it. a piece that we look at. Yeah, you know, it's kids gets the kids from the back corner of the classroom, you know, into the middle and right. being involved, which is such an important piece. Well, I think whether we're talking about sports or education in and of itself, although sports are a big part, can be a big part of education as well as a lot of the extracurriculars. That that yet again is an opportunity to broadly expose these students to different mm -hmm. uh, ranges of experiences that allow you to decide where you personally want to end up. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, for you both, I think it's pretty clear with your backgrounds and uh, what you're doing both at the law school as well as integrating uh, externships, which is a great opportunity at the law school to be able to assim assimilate into uh, law practice, I think you're going to do just that. I think you're getting that opportunity to see, do I like this? Do I not like this? Mm -hmm. And move forward towards your goals. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you both. And Absolutely. here's what I look forward to. I look forward to seeing that uh, that five and 10 year goal. Yep. Let's see where that yeah. path goes. Thank you both you very betcha. much. Right. Really appreciate Thank it. You guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great conversation. Yep. Thank you.